welcome to week 13. Like always, I'd like to start with a prayer. Dear God, we praise you for the gift of language. We thank you for the example of the Psalms, which speak to our hearts and express our innermost thoughts. Search our hearts and draw out the confessions and praises you long to hear. And all God's children said, Amen. Awesome. Last week we finished the history books of the Old Testament. This week we're going to talk about the poetry books and books of wisdom. We're going to start off with the book of Job. We don't know exactly when the book of Job was written. It's possible that the book of Job was even written before the flood of Noah. So what is the book of Job about? One of the key points of Job is that the righteous will prosper and the wicked will suffer. Actually, that's completely false. The story chronicles the life of Job. He was a righteous man and followed God's teachings, but still awful things happened to Job and his family. Job's friends tried to convince him that it was something that Job had done and he had not confessed. It's a tough book to read and it's a tough book to understand. So a couple of the key takeaways from the book of Job is, number one, we are not capable of God's understanding. God knows exactly what's going on in all of our lives, not to mention what's going on in the entire universe and what the future holds for all of us. God doesn't want us to go through tough times, but we do live in a broken world, so we will go through trials and, and hardships. But God is with us. A very famous verse comes from Job 19.25. I know that my Redeemer lives. This shows Job's ultimate trust in God. So it is wise for us to also trust God. The next book we're going to get into is the book of Psalms. Now the Psalms are actually an ancient hymnal of God's people. The book of Psalms contains songs that express pretty much every human emotion. I want you to take a second to think about all the different human emotions out there. Most of us can list off the easy ones. Happy, sad, irritated, scared. But there are many, many emotions. There's actually probably more emotions than we have words for. A lot of us, like, take the word love. Love can mean a lot of different things. The book of Psalms does a really good job of expressing all those different emotions that we have. The book of Psalms is also the largest book in the Bible. It contains 150 of the most profound and popular poems or songs in history. To this day, people write modern songs based on the text in the Psalms. Also, the longest chapter in the Bible is in Psalms, it's chapter 119. Another key is that Jesus knew the Bible very well, including the Psalms. Open up your Bibles to Psalms 22. The first verse starts with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now I want you to jump to the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 46. Now, the student Bible that we use is what we call the red letter Bible. When you see the print in the Bible that is red, that means that it is Jesus speaking. In Matthew 27, verse 46, we see Jesus on the cross quoting Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not to spoil the story, we are going to get into this a little bit later. But a lot of us know that Jesus did come on earth and he did suffer and die on a cross. Obviously, if Jesus is hanging on the cross, about ready to die, he's in a lot of pain and suffering. And what does he look to? Is one of the Psalms. He quotes Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is a way for him to express his emotions. The next book of the Bible that we're going to talk about is the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs can easily be summed up by saying, good advice. That's all it is. The book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon. Early in Solomon's life, God asked King Solomon what he desires. And, and Solomon wisely answered, 
He wanted wisdom. So God granted him wisdom. Now Solomon wasn't a perfect king, but he did use his wisdom wisely. Uh, he was a great judge. He uh, handled conflicts for the people very well. And he wanted to make sure that he shared that wisdom with us by writing the book of Proverbs. The amazing thing about the book of Proverbs, it is thousands and thousands of years old, but this wisdom still holds true today. But remember that this wisdom ultimately came from God. We think these Proverbs are so important. If you've noticed all year long that each of your handout sheets does have a section marked Proverbs with a few Proverbs listed for you to read. The next book I want to get into is the book of Ecclesiastes. If you haven't heard that name before, uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard to pr pronounce, but it is Ecclesiastes. I love my grandparents and parents very much, but it's easy for older people to get nostalgic. They talk about the good old days. They're not like today. They were so much better back when. And what does that mean to them? For some people, it's wasn't it great when everybody had a nice convertible car, two children, a nice dog, uh, a beautiful house with a picket fence in the front? If everybody could have that, that would be the perfect life, and that's what we should strive for. Ecclesiastes makes it very clear that that is not the meaning of life. We can use the word self-fulfillment, the idea that we are to work for ourselves and strive to achieve these things on earth, and that is what we can say is we accomplished a meaningful life. God, through Ecclesiastes, makes it very clear that if we strive for things that are on earth, that is a meaningless life. A meaningful life is devoted to God. He also reminds us that God is always in control of our lives. We will have times of prosperity, and we will have times of suffering, but we can always turn to God because he ultimately has control. Another key takeaway is that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A lot of people don't understand that idea of fearing somebody is wise. I like to use the analogy of a, a police officer. When a police officer is driving up and down the freeways, they're there to protect people. But what's the first thing that I'm doing? As soon as I see a police officer while I'm driving down the freeway, whether I'm speeding or not, I get nervous. I make sure that I look at my speedometer, I check all my mirrors, I look, make sure that I am driving just perfectly. Now, is that a good thing? Yes, because I should be doing that all the time. I should be driving properly so that I can keep myself, my family, and everybody around me safe. But we are especially careful of doing that when we see a police officer because we are afraid if we don't do those things, we're going to get pulled over, get a ticket. Uh, nobody wants that. Well, that's sort of the case with God. In fact, Martin Luther in the Catechism uses the words, we are to fear, love, and trust God. Obviously, we are to love God. God loves us. He created us. He wants the best for us, and he wants to spend eternity with us. And we want to love him in return. And as we learned in Job, that we are to trust God. But now we learn in Ecclesiastes that sometimes we are to fear God. God gave us a bunch of rules because he loves us and he does want the best for us. And we should strive to follow those as much as we can because not only out of love for God, but also because we know that it is good for our life. Now, I'm not saying that bad things still won't happen. They still will on earth because it is a broken world. But sometimes it is that fear of letting God down or fear of understanding bad things could happen if I don't follow these rules. As we learn from the Israelites, there are consequences to not following God. So it is the combination of loving God, trusting him, and in a way fearing God that we can live a purposeful and meaningful life. I will say that the book of Ecclesiastes is very deep. Um, this is an often debated book of the Bible. Uh, the things that I said are, are key takeaways that everybody pretty much agrees on, but it's still a great book. The last book in the book of wisdom and poetry that I want to talk about is the Song of Solomon. Some people call it the Song of Songs. Once again, it is King Solomon that wrote this book. Not only was King Solomon wise in governing and logic, 
but he was also very wise in love. In fact, kind of got him in trouble a little bit. Uh, King Solomon had a lot of wives and uh, a lot of concubines. Not exactly what God wanted for him. And of course, it has the awkward conversation of human sexuality. Now, obviously, talking about human sexuality can make us embarrassed, uh, get us uh, embarrassed cheeks, a couple of eye rolls and groans. But God invented this for us, for a purpose. One way that we show God we love him is by loving others. And we often do that by finding a spouse. And God makes it clear that human sexuality was a gift from him. And we can honor him with it. I will say in the Song of Solomon, some of the things haven't aged very well, like comparing his bride's hair to that of a flock of goats. Maybe you want one to express that to your girlfriend or wife. But if you can get past a couple of those analogies, uh, there is a lot of wisdom and a lot of wonderful poetry. So it is a wonderful book. So those are the five wisdom and poetry books of the Old Testament. But we aren't done with the Old Testament yet. Next, we are going to go into the prophets of the Old Testament. So I want to leave you with this blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. The wind be always at your back. The sun shine warm upon your face. The rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God rest on your pillow and forever hold you in the hollows of his hand. You have a great week. See you next week.